Everyone has the same five core areas of their life that ultimately determine how happy they'll be. Unfortunately, most of us have developed failure habits in each, and it's Will Moore's mission to help replace those with success habits to maximize momentum. After exiting his business for a combined nine-figure sum, Will learned it's not just about becoming an entrepreneur of your career, but an entrepreneur of the most important business you'll ever run, your life. And to crush it in your life requires firing on all cylinders in your five cores by continually taking action, building habits, and maintaining balance in each. Hello, and welcome to the Five Core Life Podcast with Will Moore, founder of More Momentum. On today's episode, host Will Moore sits down with Seth Maxwell, founder and CEO of The Thirst Project, on a mission to solve the world's water crisis. Seth Maxwell discusses how he's leading the charge of getting the youth of America to form a habit of helping others in order to make their own lives happier. The purpose behind The Thirst Project and how you can get involved. Leave a comment with the cause that you care about on YouTube or tag at More Momentum on your favorite social media platform. We'd love to hear from you. And of course, be sure to pound that subscribe button. Are you ready to fire on all cylinders? If so, let's go. What's up, man? Hey, how are you? Hey, I was just um, was just tuning your horn for you so you didn't have to do it. Oh, Telling gosh. everybody about who you are, what you're doing. Um, thank you for joining us. Very nice to meet you. Yeah, very nice to meet you. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, one of the things, let me, let me actually stick my headset in, heads in it. Um, you know, I was just telling people, you basically, uh, you dedicated your life to this ending this clean water crisis throughout the world. Um, why don't you tell us kind of how this came to be and, you know, what you're currently doing and where you're headed in the future with it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the reason that we exist is that right now, as unbelievable as it might sound still in 2021, there are still about 663 million people in the world who just don't have access to basic, safe, clean drinking water. And, you know, it's not just a really big number. What it really practically means is that in developing communities all over the world, typically women or children will walk from their homes to whatever standing water sources are available. So it's commonly rivers, ponds, swamps, but these open, unprotected sources are often shared with animals that will drink and defecate in the same water sources that people drink from. So this causes people to get really easily preventable waterborne diseases. I mean, most people don't even realize that diarrhea or dysentery actually kill more kids under the age of five every year than HIV or malaria combined. So we build freshwater wells, spring protection systems, rainwater harvesting systems in developing communities to give people clean water, which isn't super unique. There are lots of great water organizations in the world, but what is is that while we're definitely not the oldest, we're certainly the largest youth-led water organization. So uh, we started when I was 19 in college, uh, and today, sort of fast forward, we have a school tour that sends speakers who are themselves young people to go speak at assemblies at high schools, colleges, to educate students about the global water crisis and then challenge them to do something about it. Uh, and so, you know, the schools that we work with, we work last year, there are about 800 different high schools and colleges. Uh, there are hundreds of thousands of students who do crazy stuff like walks, dances, video game tournaments, all to raise awareness and funds to build water projects. And so we commit to give 100% of the money that those students raise directly to building water projects. And uh, in the last, gosh, a little over 11, almost 12 years, we've raised enough money to give over half a million people in 13 countries safe, clean water for the rest of their lives. Dude, I mean, so first of all, thank you for doing that. You know, I was just saying before you, you came on, um, you know, anybody that dedicates their life to helping other people, um, it, it's pretty cool. You know, and, and it's it's not you. It, it, correct me if I'm wrong here. I have a feeling you'll probably agree with me. Anybody that that, that does it is like so. Now that's basically what I've done. I've decided um, for the last three years. I've, I've I switched, and this is what I've been doing. I don't make any money from it. Hopefully, in the in the future, I'll at least you know break even. That's not what it's about. I I made my money doing something else. But tell me if you agree that there's no better feeling in the world, and all the money in the world can't fill that 
feeling that you get when you know that you're literally not only helping people, but even saving lives in your case. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there there is uh, no way to describe. I think once you once you get involved in something that is bigger than yourself uh, and that has a direct impact on humanity, and obviously the water crisis is one thing, right? But there are so many incredibly vital, critical, important causes and issues uh, that people in our world need others to sort of inject themselves into and be a part of building a community of people to work towards building a better world. And so I think once you get involved in something like that, uh, it's there really is nothing like it in the world. No amount of money, you know, no amount of, uh, you know, recognition or, um, you know, accomplishment in other areas could kind of even come close to that. So, to, yep, I, I had a feeling that would be your answer, um, because anybody it's, it's just it's like it's not in our nature to not be self, right? It's a, you should, a better way to say it. It's in our nature, nature to be selfish, to focus on ourselves, to do things that are going to benefit us and our immediate, you know, family, whatever, um, our, our, our inner circle. And, you know, it's, but when, and, but what ends up happening is when you are focusing only on that, you're never going to quite experience like the best of what life has to offer. And then when you step outside and then you, like you just said, you do something bigger than yourself, and you know you're making a real impact. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty neat. And I love that you're getting the youth involved because you know that's what's up, right? It's it's it needs to be this this upcoming generation that's coming in, that's understanding these things, that's getting in the habit of, oh, this feels good to help this person. Oh, now I'm going to go over here and help help this person. Now I'm going to get involved in this. I'm going to do that. Like getting more actively involved again versus just you know doing this selfishly looking at how many likes tweets today. Um, so yeah, I, I love that that's happening. So thank you for doing that. How did you get to this point where, you know, why don't you walk us through a little bit of the journey to get here? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so even today, we definitely still don't have uh, everything all figured out, but we've learned an immense amount as we've grown. And uh, so much, especially kind of early on in the process of getting to where we are, so much of laying the foundation of who we are as an organization today really is directly attributed to the leadership of our organization, and namely our board, right? So we're pretty blessed. Like We have an incredible group of people who lead our organization on our board who are a pretty diverse group of professionals from the finance finance industry, the uh, entertainment industry, uh, the business community, um, who come together and really lend their skills, their acumen. Um, and early on, I mean, my my story, when I started the organization, I have you know, a degree in theater. And so uh, I think if I do anything well, or if I've ever done anything well in this space, it's recognizing all of the many, many things I knew nothing about and finding people who were excellent at those things and doing the one thing I know how to do, which is tell a compelling story and convince them to come around the table and give their skills, their time, their gifts uh, to help really guide and lead and grow where we're going to go. And so, uh, so I mean, so much of how we're structured, even how we laid out our, you know, our operations and our financing uh, came from this group of people. Um, and still today, that's that's absolutely true. So uh, our board is incredible. Our team's pretty amazing. But um, it was pretty like slow going at first, right? I mean, the first year that we worked in this space, we worked with about 10 schools. Um, but I think, you know, the, the interesting thing was in those very, very earliest days, we had two schools at very first who did fundraisers to raise awareness of the water crisis and money to build projects. And, and after those first two schools did fundraisers, they raised about $12,000. And that was when we realized there was tremendous kind of untapped potential in students and young people. And we were like, man, if if this is what two schools could do, what if there were 100 schools? What if there were 1,000 schools? Um, and realize that nobody was really activating young people around this issue in a meaningful way um, and giving them tools that they could use to make impact on it and connecting them to uh, real solutions. And so that's sort of what drove us. And that first year, we worked with about 10 schools. The next year was about 40 schools. The next year was over 100 schools. Um, and like I said, this past year, you know, eight, 800 campuses just in that one school year alone. And so, uh, so it's been pretty incredible. But as far as like work in the field goes, the same thing's true. I mean, early on, 
we didn't know what we didn't know. And uh, we really had to seek out the expertise and advice and guidance of so many local leaders in the field who are experts in their space, who lead and work with local communities uh, designing and implementing water projects that are sustainable and that serve the needs of the people. And so, you know, the probably the most tragic statistic in our space is that over 64% of water projects that foreign nonprofits or NGOs implement just on the continent of Africa, not counting Southeast Asia, South Central America, over 64% of them fail in the first year. But if you sort of pull back the curtain and examine the causes for that, upwards of 90% of those so-called failures are what we would classify as really either inexpensive to get back online and operable or really easy repairs that communities themselves can and should be trained to do. And so we worked really, uh, it took a long time and we took about two years of working with local leaders uh, and experts in that space, in the water and sanitation and hype space, uh, who helped design our strategies for how to work with communities in the field to avoid that. And so, you know, it's it was definitely not a like overnight, hey, we, you know, we turned on a light switch and, and built to the scale or, uh, or even the sort of robust sustainability practices that we have. It, it took a lot of time to build, but um, it's been incredible. Wow. I mean, that's, that's, that's really, I mean, the, the, the journey and from start, you know, I, I went the traditional entrepreneur route, which was, you know, okay, I w this is where I want to end up. This is how I'm going to do it. And it started a business and it just once it takes one step putting in front of the next and just keep doing it. Right. And so you, now I'm, I'm doing an entrepreneur of helping people become an entrepreneur of their lives, helping people understand you know, the, how to make your life a successful startup and, and putting it in that context. And it's the same thing of just one step in front of the next. And it sounds like that's that's basically how you did it, right? Like using the law of compounding, starting small and just believing in what you're doing, having this like huge belief of knowing like this is this is something this is going to happen and not going to give up. And then just like you said, I love getting getting people around you getting smarter, right? Who is it that said, I mean, a lot of, I guess, the successful greats have said, you know, you, you want to get people around you that are smarter than you, that, that can do oh, yeah. all these amazing things. And if you have the ability through your storytelling to be able to get them to do that, you know, kudos to you. And, and obviously it's a compelling and a, an awesome argument to say, look, like this is something we need to get serious about. And it's not easy to connect with the youth. So Good for you for being able to get into these schools. And when you're talking to schools, by the way, what what age are you talking? Are you mainly saying this is all college colleges you're going to? No, in fact, uh, so college is such an interesting beast for us. We do work with a number of universities and, and colleges, but uh, because there are so many different competing agendas and class schedules and there is no sort of homogenous, uniform uh, experience that any one student at a university or college has, it's actually quite difficult for us uh, to, in a short term, make a lot of impact from a college campus. And so what we found there is a lot of the clubs that we'll build there that are thirst project chapters or clubs or a lot of the awareness initiatives or fundraisers that they'll do. We have to really have kind of that compound mindset that you're talking about and say, OK, we know that the reality is an incoming freshman or even sophomore, junior at a, at a college who really puts in a lot of groundwork in building the foundation for a thirst project group there, they may not see the fruit of what that group can really do because it may be four or five, six years down the line before, that club, are, has, yeah, right. Right, before that club even has a hundred members. And by contrast, when we work with high schools, which is, you know, I think over 74% of uh 74% of the students we work with are female and 52% of them uh, are 17 and a half year olds. And so the majority of our students are, you know, that high school junior into senior year. Uh, they're absolutely compassionate. But what we found is that even more than they're compassionate, they are competitive. If the class before them raised $10,000, they want to raise 15. And so what we found is because if we hold an assembly or we send a speaker in, students have to show up, right? They, mm. they have to show up to an assembly. It's so much easier to mobilize a large group of 500, 1,000, 3,000 students, whereas if you show up on a college campus and you don't have an existing robust presence there, it's not uncommon you know, for a group to have five, 10, 20. And so it's just so much more difficult to galvanize that support early on. Now, once it picks up that momentum, 
you know, again, kind of that compound effect. It's mm-hmm. like the snowball that's rolled down the hill for a mile and it's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. But um, that's sort of the short term versus long term play. So in a really long answer to your question, most of our students are high school students that we work with. Uh, but we do have kind of a whole range. Got it. OK, well, that's and that's even better to me. Um, you know, the younger, the better and, and getting, you know, and then they're going off into college and they've already got this this knowledge and this mindset. And, you know, for the ones that are getting involved, like I said, you know, habits, we, we are our habits. And so if you get in the habit of helping people, it's going to become addicted, as we said earlier, to the start of this because it feels so good. And you just want to do more and more and you get greedy for it. But greedy yeah. in a good way. Right. Yeah. Sorry, I just saw a comment pop up. This a road warrior who is what we call one of our speakers uh, from our school program. They came and spoke at my school and I interacted with them uh, during Key Club. Key Club is a, a service organization that we partner with. Uh, and so we're nice. kind of one of the, the causes that they will support. But yeah, that's amazing. We love Key Club. That's super awesome. Very cool. Yeah. And anybody, yeah, if we can start taking some questions here as we as we continue to chat, if people have some some questions. So um, you know, what's, what's next? What are your goals? Where do you, where do you want to head? You know, where do you want this thing to be in five years, 10 years? Yeah. Uh, so I don't think it is, uh, just a young person's idealism or naivete when I say we really want to see the end of the global water crisis. Uh, when we started over a decade ago, it used to be that 1.1 billion people in the world didn't have access to safe, clean drinking water today. That number is 663 million. So in just over a decade, while the global population has risen, the number of people without safe water has been cut in half. Uh, And so we will absolutely see the end of this issue, not just in our lifetimes, in the next maybe 15, 20 years. It's just a question of like how quickly we can move that ball down the field and we can get people to see the importance of the issue, raise awareness and take action around it. And so, uh, at the sort of big end of the funnel, the like, you know, crazy idea, that's the end goal. Uh, But in the short term right now, we are pretty hyper-focused as an organization in a country called Eswatini. So Eswatini is formerly the kingdom of Swaziland. Um, Eswatini does mean Swaziland in Siswati. Uh, It's just the king sort of renamed it a few years back. But yeah, so internationally, uh, Eswatini is unfortunately best known for having the single highest density HIV AIDS population of any country in the world. And that's relevant to our work because in rural communities, especially if people have access to medical treatment or antiretrovirals, but still drink from contaminated water sources, people's immune systems are already so compromised that the diseases they're likely to contract from surface water sources will then often kill them much faster than if they weren't already combating HIV as well. And so the ability to really make a positive impact on those two issues at once is really what drew us there. But it is, it's also a really small country. There are only about 1.4 million people in the whole country. And so we've been working towards uh, doing what really nobody has ever done before and trying to work with the local government as well as stakeholders on the ground to reach 100% coverage uh, to bring the entire country safe water as quickly as possible. So uh, that's sort of the, the short term nice. goal. That's, those are both, I mean, your short term goal is, would be still good enough to be a long term goal for, some, for anybody else. So that's, that's amazing, man. You're doing great things. Um, so and I, I assume are you tra- so with with COVID and all this? How has this affected? You know, before were you traveling to a lot of these countries? You know, and, and doing more hands on, or have you always been more hands off? And and how's that changed with COVID? Yeah, COVID's changed everything. Uh, and so I think there is often uh, a pretty understandable uh, misconception around how we build projects. A lot of people think like it's our team from the US maybe going to build projects. But the reality is, uh, we do take people into the field fairly frequently to whether they are donors or whether they are students to see the impact of the work that they've made. But the reality is our teams when we do send them from the states are uh, almost always far more in the way than they are helpful. Um, We work with we have full-time local staffers who oversee the impact in their own country. And so uh, we have country directors or community development officers that are full-time paid thirst product staffers uh, who would be, you know, Eswatini nationals or Ugandan nationals or Salvadorian nationals. And they are really the ones leading the efforts on their ground in their own countries. And they act as kind of like 
the nucleus between the Thirst Project here in the U.S., the individual communities or villages that we build projects in, and then the for-profit drilling companies that we hire or contract to actually build with us to build these projects. And so uh, they are really the ones who sort of drive the impact on the ground in their own countries. But uh, so, so COVID hasn't necessarily interrupted that because drilling and construction happen right. All the time, whether or not somebody from the U.S. is in one of the areas we're building. Uh, but where COVID did really impact us was especially in those first, I would say, four to six weeks where there was just even more uncertainty than there is today. Our biggest fear was that we didn't want to be a vector kind of carrying a virus into the most rural potentially. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I got a dog, too. Uh, you know, he started to growl, so that makes me feel better. I'm like, oh, man, he's going to bark in a minute. So now, now you've broken the ice, so we're good. That's how COVID has affected us, the work from home life. But uh, yeah, no, exactly. No. Uh, yeah. So, you know, the, the worry was that though that we didn't want to have our teams moving back and forth between the urban centers of those countries and those rural villages, potentially carrying a virus into those areas into communities that are already, I mean, the most under-resourced in terms of access to health clinics or hospitals. And so for those first few weeks, yeah. we really had our team spend time working with the communities that we'd already built projects in to alert them that this was coming, uh, try to distribute as much PPE as well as uh, hand sanitizer, soaps, hygiene kits on the ground, uh, so that if and when the virus reached those countries, uh, people were ready. And then at that point, we sort of hunkered down for the next month, trying to work with the local governments, whether it was the Ministry of Health or otherwise, to try to figure out how to architect a plan to respond. Um, and it was really encouraging and exciting, specifically in Eswatini, when the Ministry of Health came to us and asked us to help architect their response to COVID-19 in the water, sanitation and hygiene wow. sector. So we, in those next couple months, you know, we built hand, uh, uh, hand washing stations with, you know, big water tanks, with multiple spigots and distributed soap and sanitizer and hygiene kits to, you know, over a hundred of the most rural vulnerable villages or communities. Wow. Um, awesome. in in that first period of time there. But yeah, I, you know, so I've traveled much less personally uh, in the last year, you know, to go see or work with our teams on the ground, but uh, they have gone through elevated training for safety and, uh, and, you know, have been still able to continue drilling and constructing, which has been really encouraging. So, yeah. So tell me about like the process. So in, in getting them the clean water, so basically you're going, you're set up, like you said in the beginning, you know, these rivers and, and whatnot that they're getting their water from, animals defecating and, 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 and these things, unclean water. So what is the system that you're using and is it the same for every single area in terms of cleaning the water and getting it to them? No. So there is not a one size fits all solution for any community, uh, not too unlike any community that you might live in, you know, no matter where you are. And so uh, I would say the most by far the most common solution that we implement with is drilling hand pump borehole wells, uh, where we will hire local drillers with huge rigs that can drill, say, two to three hundred feet down into the ground, tapping into already existing water tables and building fresh water projects that draw up safe protected water for people. Um, those would be paired with, say, pit latrines for sanitation purposes and, you know, hygiene kits and hygiene training for hand washing and that kind of stuff. Water is really only effective in reducing disease when it's paired with sanitation and hygiene. Uh, and that really is our end goal. It's not just how much money to be raised or how many people to bring safe water to. It really is, can we measure a reduction in waterborne disease or a reduction in, you know, fatalities or, or mortality as a result of drinking unsafe water. Um, and so we'll hire these drillers, they'll go in and we will work with local communities. Communities have to say, yes, we, we want to work with you. Uh, we want this here. At that point, communities will elect water committees made of 50% women, 50% men who are trained on maintenance, repair, as well as sanitation and hygiene. Nice. Uh, but the community is involved from the very beginning and, and has to invite us in to do this work. Uh, right. To work alongside of us in that process and so what what happens then is we'll actually have hydrology and groundwater surveys carried out to determine the best place to drill uh, communities are involved in construction processes uh, the drilling will be done the construction then we'll actually do uh, pump tests and water quality tests to make sure that the water is safe for human consumption uh, and then sort of the the pass over to the community but it's a 
it's both a very long and short process. Like all of that combined takes, you know, anywhere from six to nine months. Uh, but what most people kind of think about as like the drilling or constructing process is, is actually quite short. That's like a week. Oh, wow. Yeah. Right. But a lot of, a lot of, um, stuff around de it. details. Right. So, okay. So drilling. So besides drilling, I mean, is that your main, the main way, I guess you said there's no one size fits all, but do you actually take the dirty water and have a system to filter the existing dirty water versus the drilling? And do you do that as well? So, like I said, drilling, uh, you know, freshwater wells is probably 80% of the 85% of the projects that we do. Uh, if there is, say, a naturally existing spring on the property uh, or in a community, we might protect that spring and pipe water to storage tanks and then have that uh, maybe through gravity and a reticulated system, pipe that to multiple access points throughout a community. Um, if there is sufficient rainfall in a community, we may also do a combination of those types of solutions and rainwater catchment or rainwater harvesting um, in some areas where there just simply isn't adequate groundwater or rainfall, uh, but there are surface water sources that are contaminated, like you're talking about, we might do biosand water filters so people would use the actual surface water sources uh, and then filter through there. But by and large, uh, you know, I would say 85 plus percent of the projects we do are, are drilled wells. Um, so it's, it's, you know, our preferred solution for sure. Uh, yeah, got it. That's good to know. Um, okay. And then, so these, these people, you set it up for them, you get it all. And then you're essentially relying on them. So, I mean, do you guys circle back like every couple of months, once a year and see how things are going? Or do you essentially just, like you said, you train these 50% men, 50% women to sort of manage it and, and take it on moving forward. And, and what has the success been with that? I, I can imagine that would be tricky. I can see some, you know, maybe some communities, they, they take it very seriously and they're all about it. And then maybe some just say, well, this isn't part of what we've been doing in our routine and then they neglect it. So how does that work? Yeah, I would say by and large, uh, we don't really, we've been super fortunate that we haven't really encountered uh, kind of what you described there as far as, you know, a lot of neglect or anything like that. Um, generally speaking, if we're working in or with a community, uh, it, it is because Either that community has specifically reached out and requested collaboration on a project or uh, has been maybe identified by a, a local government that we're working in conjunction with to help build projects there. And so uh, as far as like the follow up process, uh, the checkpoints that we have in the first year, it's every quarter. So uh, every three months, someone from our team on the ground, again, those local nationals from their own country will go out and visit a site and there's a series of checklists sort of items they need to make sure that it's still functional that it's still uh you know safe for consumption still serving the people and adequate to meet the needs of that community um and then again that's the first year is four times a year the second year it's three times the third year it's two times uh and then the fourth year it's once and it comes like a once a year visit uh every year after that nice nice yeah, yeah. that makes a lot of sense so well that's great to hear that that the people are are you know taking good care of it and then it's kind of like a like you said it's it's a front-loaded process and then once once you they're set up then you guys can kind of move on to the next which is great you know and not have to put in a lot of manpower and resources into actually managing it because i can imagine that would be not scalable yeah, yeah absolutely and that's that you know for us the, there is obviously in the sort of nonprofit or, or NGO space, there's a lot of uh, conversation that is continually evolving around the distinctions between uh, what is, you know, aid versus what is uh, true international development work and what does it look like to work with or in collaboration with a community versus uh, giving stuff to or doing things for a community. And I think, you know, what's uh, for us, we really want to try to build partnerships with communities that are as dignified as possible, that are as equitable as possible. Uh, it's very clear from the beginning, this isn't my project. This isn't uh, the Thirst Project's project. This is the community's project, um, you know, which is super critical, not only for the sustainability or longevity of that project, but also uh, it's super critical just in terms of us trying to do work that is just like I said, as as dignified and equitable as possible. Um, I think there's a lot of conversation, a lot of really good conversation happening in the space right now as far as uh, what is the industry standard and how should it evolve in terms of 
uh, how we tell the stories of the people of the communities that we work in, stories that are not our own, uh, stories that we've been entrusted with uh, in ways that are not exploitative, in ways that do not position ourselves as sort of the saviors of a community, but really are uh, collaborators and partners of and, and people that are working in those communities to make impact. And so um, there's a lot of really meaningful work, uh, I think, really elevating the standards of how we work with communities and how we tell those stories. Uh, that's really key. Yeah. Well, and a universal principle that you're tapping into is, you know, when when somebody thinks it's their own thing, they're going to take much better care of it than if it's something somebody else's thing. Right. So yeah. making it like this is yours and we're, we're helping you and we're going to work with you to build it. And then it's you, you own it and, and it's your responsibility type of thing. Um, you know, how you present that, I can imagine is, is very important, you know, making sure that you nail that part of it so that they aren't just like, who are these people coming in and building this thing? You know, it's like, obviously, yeah, it helps us, but they'll, they'll take care of it. It's like, no, this right. is yours. We're, we're, we're helping you build it. And now, you guys got to manage it and take care of it. So this has been awesome, man. Thank you. And actually, there was one question. I want to answer this, and then I have one last question for you. Um, have you answer this. How can we use wastewater? Dominic, thank you. How can we use wastewater in solving this crisis uh, in our community? There's plenty of wastewater. How can we use the technology to solve it? Yeah, I saw that pop up. Uh, and so uh, for me, this will hopefully... It probably won't be a very satisfying answer, but uh, I just decided a long time ago uh, to not pretend that I know things that I don't know. And the reality is uh, the difference in the types of projects that we build. Most of the solutions for the communities that we work in are incredibly simple solutions. Um, hand pump borehole wells, uh, rainwater catchment systems, spring protection systems. The reason for which is because typically the communities that we work in, even if there is uh, electricity through a grid that's been run out to those areas, oftentimes uh, building a, a generator or a pump that requires that kind of ongoing maintenance will introduce a cost that's not sustainable for that community. And so the problem will be that they can't, a community may not be able to sustain that long term. And so the simpler solutions we have found tend to be the most sustainable. Um, and the communities that we work in, the kinds of projects that we build, generally are are not that type of technology that don't deal with cleaning wastewater or uh, that kind of project. And so the water crisis is pretty massive in scope and really kind of has three different types of buckets of the water crisis. Really, there is the immediate kind of human water crisis. That is, people are drinking unsafe water and, and contracting waterborne diseases and, and dying from things that really shouldn't kill them because there are simple, easy solutions. That's really what we do. Uh, but then on a larger scale, there is sort of the environmental water crisis, which deals with, you know, how are we stewarding our water resources as a global community? Uh, are there new technologies that we should introduce to make sure that we can, in fact, have adequate water to meet the needs of all people. Uh, that's a much bigger question that I think that question kind of falls into. And then there's an even bigger issue, which is like the political water crisis, which deals with, you know, is water a human right? Can governments or private companies privatize water? Uh, what is the regulation and legislation around that? That is an even bigger, very different mm -hmm. issue. Um, and we deal almost exclusively kind of in the first. And so, uh, like I said, I, I just made a decision a long time ago not to pretend that I know things Smart. I don't know. But, uh, I don't know the answer to that question. So a wise man. That, that, that's a, that's a wise man who says, uh, I don't know. Um, too many people try to try to answer things that they're not experts and stick to, you know, like you, you've clearly got something you have developed this, you've got a special ability and you have figured out your niche, your niche with it and are helping the world with it. And you're doing it in a certain way. You can't be everything to all, all people. So Kudos again, man. This has been fantastic. Um, I guess the last thing I just want to ask, you know, how can people get involved? You know, anybody listening, um, we're going to put this on our podcast. We'll, we'll repost clips on our, um, our different uh, pages, social media and whatnot. How can people get involved? And make yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, the incredible thing is that, and this is true, the math on this is, is honestly pretty incredible and, uh, and tragic as well, but as little as 25 US dollars is enough to give one person safe, clean water for the rest of their life, uh, which is amazing. And so, you know, whether that means giving or uh, you know, launching your own fundraiser, you can visit thirstproject.org for information on how to bring us to your school. If you are a student or a teacher or a parent, uh, you can learn how to give there or also text the keyword thirst 
to 97779. Uh, and someone from our team will reach out and connect with you to figure out how to get you connected and get you information on, again, how to give, how to get us involved in your school and, uh, and make an impact together. I'm on your website right now and I'm, I'm on there. I'm about to donate. Um, I'm going to do a hundred bucks. Uh, that's four people. So thank why you. not quadruple it people? Why one when you can do four? Um, I love this and thank you for sharing that. And so, yeah, again, that's thirstproject.org. Super simple. You've reduced the friction in donating. Sometimes you're like, where do I go? How do I just boom, click, make it easy. Um, and you know what? Maybe you didn't hold the door for somebody this week. Maybe, you know, you butt in front of that little old lady at the line, do this and your karma will magically be fixed, at least for this week. I can't guarantee the rest of it, but um, nice work, man. Thanks for being on the show. Um, I want to connect with you. I'm, I'm going to connect with you separately um, through, through DM. I want to ask about, because I'm, I'm starting to get into speaking and spreading my message and what I'm doing to help people as well. Um, yeah. change their habits, change their life. And this is, this is a perfect, this is a perfect example, you know, a habit of, of giving back, of doing good um, and then actually caring about other human beings and getting out of your own head. So um, I may try to connect with you on, you sounds like you've already connected with and spoken at a lot of these schools. So that's one of the areas I was looking at. So I might talk yeah. to you about that. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for having us and, uh, and for everybody who's watching, I promise we definitely uh, don't take it for granted and, and have a great rest of your week. Yeah, man. You too. All right. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you Thank all next you. time. All right. Take care. That's it for today's episode of the Five Core Life Podcast with Will Moore, founder of More Momentum. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you have not already, please make sure to subscribe and follow the podcast wherever you are listening or watching this so that you get notified when new episodes air every week. And if you've not joined the Five Core Life Facebook group, I encourage you to join that and see what all of the fuss is about there's some awesome content designed to get your momentum going, including a monthly giveaway to win a complimentary coaching call with the Will Moore. The Facebook group is currently the only place to get Will's dedicated attention on your five core journey. If you're feeling stuck or just want someone to cheer you on, then that is the place you need to be. There's nothing like a community of people on the same journey to get you fired up, kicking butt, and taking names. So come join us. Get moving. Gain momentum. Join the movement. Join Emmett by going to moremomentum.com to take a free life evaluator quiz on where you currently stand in each of your five course.